Not right now, but they're for you guys. You're welcome. All right. So chapter seven is where we're going to start this semester. So chapter seven is concerning the laws of sines and cosines. In general, um, the goal for this chapter is to be able to solve triangles. When we say solve a triangle, what do we? What is that really asking you to do? So if the direction asks you to solve the triangle, what is it asking for? Go ahead. Great. So it just wants you to find all the angle measures. And all the side lengths. Now, for right triangles, this is easy. We've already done this previously in the first semester. We can just use our right triangle definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent, and inverses where appropriate, and it's not a big deal, right? We've done that already. For non-right triangles, we cannot use SOHCAHTOA. We can't use those right triangle definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent. We need something else. That something else is going to be the law of sines and cosines, are going to be the tools that we use to deal with the non-right triangle situations. So we'll start today by talking about the law of sines. I'm going to derive the law of sines for you guys so you can see where um, that comes from. When I do derivations like this, are these things that I'd expect you to be able to reproduce? No. no. This is just kind of, so it's not magic um, where these formulas kind of come from. It's just to help inform you is so that you understand why this works. Okay. Um, so let's imagine we have some non-right triangle. Here, we'll call this non-right triangle A, B, C. So I've named the vertices of the triangle A, B, and C. Aside from this derivation, something very important for this chapter is the convention we use to now name the side lengths for this triangle. So we're going to name the side lengths for this triangle with the lowercase letters A, B, and C that correspond to the uppercase letters for the vertices for this triangle. So uh, which side, one, two, or three, would I label as little a? One. one. You want to pick the side that's opposite that vertex. So which side would be little b? Two is correct. And then obviously little c is the third side. Very important that you understand this naming convention are able to identify like which side is like little a or little b or little c because that's the way the formulas are stated. And if you screw up, if you don't have the right number in the right place, the formulas are not going to work for you. Does that make sense on how we're doing that naming? Very important that you're able to do that and you remember to do that when we're using these formulas. Okay, um, so we have this non-right triangle, ABC. How do I know that it's a non-right triangle? It's kind of a silly question. You can look at this and be able to tell. What, what do you see here that tells you this is not a right triangle? There's not a little right angle symbol in one of the corners, right? That's it. Easy enough, right? Okay, so I'm going to still try to use 
my right triangle definitions of sine, cosine, and tangent. But to be able to use those, I need to have a right triangle. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw in this altitude. So altitude is a geometry term where we're going to draw a segment that goes from the vertex to the opposite side that intersects that opposite side at a 90 degree angle. So what this has done then is it's made two right triangles. Everybody kind of see that? So I've just basically split this non-right triangle up into two right triangles by drawing in this altitude. So if I look at the blue triangle there, I can say that sine of A is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. And if I look at the green right triangle, I can say that sine of B is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Okay, so wherever you want. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to rewrite both of these two equations in terms of h, because each of these two equations contain that h in common, right? After I've rewritten these in terms of h's, I can make a substitution and set them equal to each other. So what I'll do is I'll cross multiply. That gives me h is equal to b times sine a. And then h is equal to a times sine b. So when I substitute them together, I get b times sine a equals a times sine b. Everybody OK there? What I'm going to do then is I'm going to just divide both sides by a, b. When I do that, on this side the b's cancel, and on that side the a's cancel. That leaves me with sine a over a equals sine b over b. Everybody okay there? So what I would do then is I would repeat this same process, drawing in another altitude that's either going to depending on which altitude I draw in, I'd either get sine A over A equals sine C over C, or sine B over B equals sine C over C. Doesn't really matter which one you do, because when you then take this proportion and the other proportion, you can link them together through the transitive property, because they have one of the ratios is in common, that gives us the complete version of the law of sines which is sine A over A equals sine B over B, which is equal to sine C over C. Everybody okay with that formula? Okay, we'll do some examples here in a moment. Um, so in order to use this formula, I'm going to pick two of these ratios and set them equal to each other. Because all three of the ratios are equal, I can pick and choose whichever two ratios I want to set equal to each other. So I can say like sine A over A is equal to sine C over C, or sine b over b is equal to sine a over a, whatever pair of ratios I need to work with in my specific problem, I can just set those two ratios equal to each other. Okay with that idea? Okay. So in order to use the law of sines, what am I going to need to have? I'm either going to need two angles and one side, Or I'm going to need one angle and two sides. Everybody agree with that? Okay. 
So specifically, if we remember back to um, our geometry course, when we talked about congruent triangles, there are several triangle congruence theorems that we learned about in our honors geometry class. I know that was a long time ago. Um, but they're all given with like three letter combinations. Does anybody remember any of those? Sophie? Side, side, side. side, side, side would be one. Okay. Side, angle, side. Angle, side, side was not one of them. Oops. Angle, side, angle. Good. There's one more. It's angle, angle, side. So these two cover this situation. This one covers this situation. We can't use the law of sines, though, to deal with a side, 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 or a side, angle, side. Why not the side, angle, side? Because we have two sides and an angle. Maria? Right, because the angle that's given is opposite the side you don't know, so you don't have a pair, an angle and side pair for one of the ratios. Exactly right. So these guys, then, guess what we're going to use for these? Those we're going to have to deal with using the law of cosines. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay with that situation? Um, and this situation we need to talk some more about. Because this is the most difficult part of this whole chapter, is dealing with that situation, the side-side angle. Um, so let's look at an example here of one of these two cases. Sound good? <coughs> Bye, girls. You're welcome. See you later. So let's say we want to solve the triangle where angle A is 32 degrees, angle B is 73 degrees, and side C is 13 inches. The first thing I would do for any of these kind of geometric based problems is start by kind of drawing myself a picture just so that I don't mess up the naming when it comes to like what side is where and what's it, what their names are and all that. So I'm going to draw a generic triangle. I don't know what this triangle looks like. It doesn't really matter. It's not to scale. Um, so it doesn't really matter to me. So I'll just start by just going ahead and writing in my values that are given and writing in some labels for my vertices and sides. Just as an aside, um, is this the angle angle side or the angle side angle situation? This is angle side angle. How do I know it's angle side angle? Well, because the side is in between the angles, right? If the 13 was where the A or the B was, it would be angle angle side because you have two angles in a row and then the side, as opposed to this where the side is in between the two angles. Is that okay? So, uh, what's the f so to solve my triangle, I need to find the measure for angle A. I need the value for side A and the value for side B, right? Those are the three more things that I need to finish solving this triangle out. Uh, which of these is going to be the easiest thing to find first? Angle C, great. How am I going to find angle C? Good. 
So this was a geometry theorem, if you don't remember. It's called the triangle sum theorem, and it says the interior angles of any triangle must add to be 180 degrees. So since I know two of the angles, I can find the third one just by subtracting them from 180. So there's one answer. Uh, what should I solve for next? Does it matter? No. So let's just pick one. Let's solve for A next. So what am I going to write to solve for A? Well, I'm going to use the law of sines. And which two proportions should I use for the law of sines to solve for side A? I'm going to use A and C. Everybody agree with that? I need to use A because I'm worried about side A. Why did I choose C instead of B? Because I know all the information for C. I know angle C and I know side C. I don't know both pieces of information for B. So I can say that sine of 32 over A is equal to sine 75 over 13. If I cross multiply, that gives me A times sine 75 is equal to 13 times sine 32. And then if I divide both sides by sine 75, I have my value for A. So I'm going to type this into my calculator. Uh, what mode does my calculator need to be in for this problem? Degree mode, because the angle measures were given to me in degrees, so I'll check that first just to make sure. And then I'm just going to type this in exactly as it's written. So I like to use the fraction command because, well, it's hard to screw up the parentheses if you do that. How did I make the little fraction come up on my calculator like that? If I press alpha and the y equals button, it brings up that fraction menu, and you just pick the first one. So that's going to give me, uh, I'm going to take three decimal places, I guess. So let's say 7132. That's a second answer. Now let's solve for B. Uh, so I know two of the side lengths. Can I solve for B just using the Pythagorean theorem? No. Why not? Not a right triangle. Yeah. So seems like a silly question to ask that, but multiple students every year We'll try to use the Pythagorean theorem on non-right triangles, so I want to make sure I make a point of that now. So again, have to have a right triangle to use the Pythagorean theorem, so this is not one of those situations. So instead, what should I use? The law of sines. Which two ratios should I put together to solve for side B? Well, I definitely need the one with the Bs in it. And then I'm going to pick C. Why, would, uh, why is C a little bit better than A? Yeah, we rounded for side A. Side C was given exactly. So we'll get a little bit of a better answer by using uh, C rather than A. Although if we're rounding to three decimal points, it might not even make a difference. But you never know, right? Just being careful. And then we'll just cross multiply. And then divide by sine 75. And when I do that, I get 
And that's that. Any questions about this one? Okay. So if you're given the angle side angle or angle angle side situation, they, base, they basically just work out like this example. Doesn't really matter which one you get. They're both really the same problem. You find the third angle and then you solve for the two sides. Nothing weird can happen, presuming that you're in the right mode or whatever, but they basically don't get any different than that. What I want to return and talk some more about was this situation here, where you have this side-side angle situation. So remember back to geometry, there was no side-side angle congruence theorem. Why not? Because if you have that situation, you're not guaranteed the two triangles need to be congruent. It's possible you can draw two different triangles that have that same side, pair of side lengths and angle measure. So we have to be very careful in this situation. Um, we had a, in geometry, we had a special version of side side angle that works if that angle measure is 90 degrees. If we have a right triangle, then you have enough to do a side side angle. But if it's a non right triangle, we have to be very careful. So that's what I want to talk a bit more about is this situation. We call this situation the ambiguous case because, well, there could be two possible triangles. So this is basically the situation that's happening here. So if this is my triangle ABC, notice that triangle ACD and triangle BCD have the same congruent sides and the congruent angle, but they are definitely not the same triangle, right? So this is the ambiguous case situation where this can happen. Um, but there's some other things that we have to be a little bit careful about in this situation as well, because you just can't write down willy-nilly any two sides and an angle and even have a triangle exist at all. So let's look at some of these situations. <coughs> So the first situation we want to talk about is where that given angle is greater than or equal to 90 degrees. Actually, let's draw it a little bit better so it actually looks like what we're going what's going on here. Actually, before I write this. So we're given angle A. For a side-side angle situation, 
I could be given A, B, and B, C, or I could be given A, C, and B, C. Everybody agree with that? Since we have two sides in a row and then an angle in either of those two situations. In either of these two situations, what side has to be included? B, C, right? Or C, B, whatever you want to call it, doesn't matter. Everybody see that? What special name would I give to BC in this triangle? Starts with an H. It's the hypotenuse, right? Everybody agree with that? Okay. So if my angle A is greater than or equal to 90 degrees, and the hypotenuse is the longer side I have one triangle. If the hypotenuse that's given is not the longest side, there's no triangle possible. That's a nonsense situation. Since BC must be the hypotenuse, So that's the only thing you have to be careful about if, the, if your given angle is not acute. You just have to make sure that the side that's the hypotenuse is actually the longest side. Otherwise, this runs exactly as you'd expect and nothing weird can happen. Okay? So the second situation is if that given angle is acute. So I'm just going to draw some generic triangle ABC. Actually, let's just do that. Oh, boy. So If I have an acute angle that's given and the side opposite that given angle is the biggest or equal side, still nothing weird happens. You just get one triangle. Where the weirdness can happen is if that given side or the side opposite the given angle is shorter than the other given side. Here is where things can kind of fall apart, where we can have lots of different situations. You can have zero triangles possible, one triangle possible, or two triangles possible. This is really what we refer to specifically as the ambiguous case, is the situation where you have an acute angle that's given, and the side opposite that acute angle is the shorter of the two given sides. So how can we tell Let's look at an example and kind of illustrate that.
So let's say we have a triangle PQR where angle P is 56 degrees, side P is 16 degree or 16, and Q is 19. So I'm just going to draw a generic triangle here. Everybody okay with what I've drawn? Note that this triangle I've drawn is not to scale. I don't know that that's exactly what this triangle looks like, or even if there's a triangle possible at all right now. I just wanted to draw kind of a picture to kind of get my labels in the right place so I can use my formulas. So first thing I want to do is determine if this is that weird ambiguous case situation. So since the angle I'm given is acute and the side opposite that acute angle is less than the other side that's given to me, this is that ambiguous case. So there's going to be zero, one, or two triangles possible. First thing I want to do is determine which one of those situations I'm in, right? Okay. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use the law of sines to kind of figure this out. So I'm going to start by saying sine of P over P is equal to sine of Q over Q. And I'm going to cross multiply and then divide And I'm going to look at the value here that I get for sine of Q. And it's this value here that's going to tell me what the situation is going on. If this value is greater than zero, I'm sorry. If this value is greater than 1, I have 0 triangles. If it's equal to 1, I have exactly 1 triangle. And if it's less than 1, I have 2 triangles. So let's explain why that makes sense. So if I go back to thinking about sine of Q, I know that sine of Q must be a positive value because I'm always going to be taking the sine of a angle in the first two quadrants, which is always positive, and then multiplying and dividing by lengths, which are always positive. So I know that that's always going to be a positive value. So I know that we're talking about something in the first quadrant, or the first two quadrants, right? Well, if I think back to my unit circle, sine can be positive in these two locations, right? I could have something comma 0.984 and then something comma 0.984 at these two locations. So that's where I'm getting the two triangles from if I have an acute value. There's exactly one location where the sign is 1. That's when the, it's 90 degrees. This is why that special case for the side-side angle theorem exists in your geometry class, that if you have a right triangle and the side-side angle situation, that is congruence, or is enough for congruence, because you're only going to get one kind of triangle. It has to be that right triangle. And then I know 
that the domain for sine, I'm sorry, the range for sine is always between negative 1 and positive 1. So if my value for sine is greater than 0, I'm sorry, greater than 1, that's impossible, right? There's no, there's no angle that exists that can do that. So there can't be any triangle that contains this non-existing angle. Does that make sense? Okay. So now that we've identified that we have two triangles possible, let's finish solving this and finding the two sets of answers here. Sound good? Okay. So I'm going to just label triangle one over here and triangle two over here. For each of these, the given information holds. What's going to be different is our values for Q, for R, and then little r. So let's find Q first because we've already done almost all the work to find Q. So if I go back up here, I know that sine of Q is equal to 0.984, right? So if I take the sine inverse of both sides, and then I type that into my calculator, I actually want to use the whole decimal though when I'm going to do this. So let's do sine inverse of 19.4. What was that? 56 over 16. So that gives me 79.9 or But remember, we could get two possible answers for this. I think you're in the wrong class. Well, this is my off. Yeah. No, it's a linear class. For honors, trig, and pre calc? I have no clue. Unless I'm in. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So to get angle Q over here, the other place where sine has the value of um, 0.984 is 180 minus that answer. It's always going to be that way. So you can find the acute angle by using your calculator. And you can find the other answer by using um, 180 minus the previous answer. Everybody OK there? Now to get angle R, that's going to be really easy. I can just use the triangle sum theorem. So 180 minus 56 minus 79893 gives me 44,107. 
And when I do the same thing, oops, I get 23893. Everybody okay there? And then the last thing I need to do is solve for this side R. And I can do that using the law of sines. So I'm going to do sine 56 over 16 is equal to sine of, I'm using my answer for angle R, which was 44107 in this triangle. So when I cross multiply and divide, if you get that, and when I type that in, I get 13,432. And we'll do the same thing in this triangle. But remember, in this triangle, I have a different value for R. In this triangle, my value for R was 23,893. So when I cross multiply and divide, I have that. Put that on the side so you can see that new stuff. Oops. And you'll notice that when I'm doing this, I'm trying to use all the decimal places from my calculator. My recommendation is you do the same thing. Don't try to use your rounded answers in here. In particular, when you have to use the sign inverses and stuff, um, because a little bit of rounding can have a big impact on those inverses. Uh, so what do we have? 7.187, or 817, excuse me. Right, I already forgot. Is everybody okay with that idea? And this situation right here where you have to deal with the two triangles, I think it's the hardest thing in this chapter. So get it over with now. I think the rest of the topics in here are not too terribly complicated. You're basically just using formulas the rest of the way. Um, this is the only one where you have to be a little bit careful about how you're using the formula and making sure to get all of the possible answers. OK with that? Um, so for your homework, uh, you guys can do 1 through 14.